Hey, welcome to the Do Good Work podcast. Today we have a productive profits segment and we're talking about the digital service pricing guide, how to strategically and ethically double to even triple your pricing to help you grow a thriving team and attract winning clients. And yes, raising your prices does attract a different level of clientele. So if you just want the short of it, you could just double your pricing and be done with it. However, that's like throwing darts into the dark. Yeah, you don't know what you're aiming for. You don't know how you're doing it. So I want to give you the strategies really uh, of how to walk through this step by step, um, some frameworks, some ideas, considerations. And the key thing here is that doing this will give you the certainty to allow you to ensure that you have a growing and profitable team for your services business and that you're attracting and serving your clients at the highest level possible. That's really the end game. Your bottom line is your revenue, but your true bottom line is the impact that you're making to your clients and the reputation that you create. Create Because if you just sell to sell, then you're going to have hundreds of minuscule clients. You'll be super stressed. You'll have horrible ratings. You can grow that way. I've seen it happen. But trust me, why would you want to go on that journey? Or if you're in that journey, well, let's, let's hit a... Let's hit a U-turn and actually uh, build this strategically. So in this podcast, we're going to dive deep into designing profitable task units, identifying your real market promise, and understanding why your client truly buys from you with perception mapping and positioning yourself to win with product value mapping. So these strategies have helped teams that I've personally consulted with to create greater profit margins, stronger offerings, and a better overall client experience. So if you're into that, please keep on listening. So even if you're a digital consultant, the following strategies will prepare you for when you're ready to fly with your team and all your next discovery calls. So if you're doing this solo and if you're doing this as a solo artist, like still focus on these strategies because as you grow, you will naturally lean into these anyways. So might as well get started now. So for starters to get everything up and rolling, let's hit the first aha moment. So the first aha moment for you to realize is you're most likely undercharging for your digital services. Let's repeat that again. You're not charging enough. And if you ever want to get out of the spinning wheel of your business by yourself and grow a thriving team, you need to design profitable task units. So let's talk about a task unit, why they even matter, how I structure them, and the step-by-step. So most most digital consultants, like you know, you don't charge enough for your services, but you also struggle to answer the question, how much should I be charging? How much should? You know, the question should isn't a is you have to be charging this much, you need to be charging that much. But however, you can get to a very um I wouldn't say scientific, but a very precise number of how much you want you should be charging depending on your profit margins and how you design task units. So let's actually solve that together now. Um, if you're listening to this podcast in the car, please don't do this exercise. But if you're at your desk or if you're in the office, take out a sheet of paper or a spreadsheet and list out your company's monthly overhead. You know, if you're driving, you probably have this top of mind. If you do, you're you're a legend. If not, do this when you get back to the office. But take out the piece of paper, write in your company's overhead. And then your overhead will include your operations, your costs, your vendors, your salaries, staff, contractors, accounting, graphics, copywriting, office space, tools, software, and so on. So things to run your business. We're calling this overhead. And be very specific. I want when you're, if you have a team, I want you to know, like, is this team part of administration and operations or is this team member that I'm counting here supporting the actual client? Um, themselves. So just keep that in mind because there's going to be a delineation for that. And part of your overhead, now this can be debatable, and part of your overhead, I would uh, suggest and encourage you to include your base salary as an overhead expense, depending on how you like to pay yourself. You know, some business owners and digital founders like to pay themselves as an expense. Others want to take it from the profit from what's left over. Um, others want to do a combo of a base salary plus, um, you know, owner's pay from the profit. However you calculate your pay, just keep that in mind. Like if you have a base salary, you know, maybe it's 10K a month, maybe it's 12K, 15K a month. Put that here. If you don't dip out of the, the overhead and you only take what's left over, then you can include zero. But again, ask your accountant or review specifically. Now, once we have your base overhead of your company, now it's time to isolate the salaries 
of the team members or contractors that work directly and only with your clients. So this is very specific. If they, if you deliver a service, let's say you deliver a design service and you have a head designer and then you have a, an actual graphic designer that's under that head, you know, creative director, you know, those two people will go under this per, uh, particular list of people who work directly with clients. And the goal here is to design a task unit to identify specifically how are we going to design a client service task unit that's most profitable and supports your overhead. So with this salary, let's say you have two people, or let's say we have three people, a, a director, an account manager, and maybe a support specialist. Again, looking at a design um, a creative agency structure, you could have a creative director, you could have a lead designer, and then you can have a project manager. You know, in the, that those three are part of a task unit. So let's just keep that example pretty simple. So calculate their salaries, add them up, divide it by 12 to get the monthly cost. Next is to list how many clients you have and your average revenue per client per month. So let's say you have, um, you have to tally up how many clients you have. And plus, if you have a range of fees, let's say you start have some clients that are on retainer at the early stage where you charge $4,000 a month and you have some clients on retainer that are like $12,000 a month. So get the average of um, your revenue uh, per client per month. Now, getting this information so far, I know this is a lot of information, but you have four things so far. You have your total number of clients, you have your average revenue per client per month, you have the total cost of your company's overhead, and you have the total cost of the task unit that delivers the services to your clients. So I know this can be boring work, but trust me, once you have this dialed, dialed in, you'll literally be able to design what profit margin you want from your di digital services and budget the salary that you want for yourself and build a team profitably. I say that with confidence because I've rinsed and repeat this and done this multiple times. Now, with this information, we're going to calculate a task unit return on investment. And we're going to take into account your overhead. We're going to take into account the salary of the team that takes care of your clients. And we're going to take into account how many clients they can handle and the average uh, amount that the client is paying. So to do this, again, review for your task unit. If we're looking at a director, manager, and a project manager, um, so these are three different people that support a set number of clients. How many clients can they handle? What's the average price that that client is paying per month? How many, how many months do those clients stick with you? That's just important to know for you to understand and optimize your customer lifetime value. But when you do that, number of clients multiplied by average uh, retainer price or average fee that you collect from the clients month in, month out. That is the total revenue that you deliver from your task unit. And then the cost of the task unit is obviously the salary of that three person team plus the overhead cost that it takes to run your business. Now, if you have one task unit, obviously the overhead is divided by one because you have one task unit. If you have multiple task units, so my teams have, uh, I don't know, up to upwards of, I stopped counting, I think upwards of five, but the average is three, you know, two to three task units, depending on the size of the business. But if you have up to like three task units, then you divide your overhead, divided by three, and then you can equal like, you can have a, a balance of how much each task unit is actually costing you to deliver services to your clients. So once you have that, you have a task unit ROI. The formula is the revenue of the task unit, subtract the cost of the task unit, divided by the cost of the task unit. Remember that the cost includes, it includes the overhead. Now, when we go through this, um, you should have a, a good understanding of what is my actual profit margin. And you will either be ecstatic that your margins are pretty healthy and high um, for service-based digital first businesses, you know, 35, 40% is ideal. You know, nothing lower than that is, you can obviously operate and live with that, but I would suggest like you want to hit at least 35% profit margins. If you're below that, don't worry. There are key variables that you can control. Here are the following four key variables that you control that you can optimize and that you can grow. So the first key variable is your average revenue per client. So how do you control your average revenue per client? This is controlled by your pricing. And this is the premise of 
this podcast episode to see how much do I have to charge for this to be, you know, an econo- make economical sense for me and my business. Number two is the total number of clients that you serve. This is ultimately controlled by your marketing and sales. Number three, the third variable that you can control is your labor efficiency. So depending on how many clients your task unit can handle. So this is uh, controlled by a number of factors, including your ability to hire, ability to train, your operations, your team structure design, and the level of um, seniority or expertise that you have in your business. So labor efficiency is important because if you have a task unit that can only handle five clients versus a task unit that can handle you know, 25 clients, there is a huge dramatic difference. You can design for both. Like I've, I've seen both and why well, I've seen mostly like 12 to, to 15 to 18 client task units, but you can design for both depending on, on your price points, your positioning in the market, which we'll get to, but then also how you want to grow your company. Do you want to grow by number and volume or do you want to grow by boutique quality and price? There's no wrong answer here. And the fourth key variable that you control is your overhead, your costs. So can, this is again controlled by your operations. If you have super high overhead, we can start looking at why do you have super high overhead? And this isn't a way for you to just cut costs for cutting sake. You know, I'm not an accountant and I don't want to, to, to look at your spreadsheets and start telling you to cut things. But I would say, are you making the most use of the purchases, the tools, the software, the, the teams, the fractional people that you have? And oftentimes, I think that there is a huge lack in efficiency, which brings back uh, to the third factor of labor efficiency. So because this is more, uh, this pod is more focused on the pricing situation, let's dive into how to increase your profit margins uh, and ensure it through your pricing, but doing this in a way where if you just change your pricing, which you easily can do over any given weekend, but how to do this the right way, because when you have higher prices, this does come with a greater responsibility because you will be seen as a more pristine offering and you have to deliver at that level. If not, you're just going to um, you know, charge the prices for a luxury car, but deliver you know, a non-luxury experience. We don't want that to happen. So let's actually cover positioning and identifying your real promise to the marketplace. So most questions uh, in cocktail parties or at dinners are, what do you do? And it's, honestly, it's I hate this question, but we're not going to talk about how to pitch yourself. And obviously that's the most boring question in the world, but we, we do want to focus are, is the hidden premise behind that question to identify the real transformation that you provide to your ideal client, not just your, your, your client that wants to give you money because you know, you want the business, but your ideal client. So this simple exercise that we're going to go through alone, and I did the math on it has helped my clients increase their pricing up to triple and has helped them attract clients who love working with them. Clients that actually love working with the service provider. That's key. That's a huge difference in the experience, not only as a business owner, but also in the work that you do. Your journey matters so much and I can, I'll always be an advocate for your experience and your journey. So, so the core to this exercise that we're about to do is the transformation question, the transformational question. Here's the question. What specific high leverage problem do you solve for your clients and what changes in their world when this problem is solved? So the key words here, high leverage and what actually changes in the world of your clients. So the key that like, let's, let's say you're an accountant and when you, when people tell you, Hey, what do you do? You say, Oh, I just do accounting. Answering this question can change that answer from, Oh, I just do accounting to, I help my clients become better husbands by saving them $15,000 a year so they can take more vacations with their family. I mean, that's pretty, pretty niche and pretty specific on what they do, the cost savings, the benefit to that and the emotional benefit that happens to their ideal client target who seems to be uh, a husband and to, to a family and being able to spend more time with family. Now, that's who are you going to buy from? 
uh, I'll just do your accounting versus I'll save you X amount so that you can actually take more vacations with your family and be a better spouse. Who are you going to buy from? So to run with this example, even though you might not do accounting, just, just run with this, your ideal clients want a transformation. They don't buy a service. They don't buy a product. They buy a result. So the question then becomes, who are my ideal clients and what do they truly care about? So if you're going to do this research, here is the hit list of the questions that I would start with. And these are the exact points that I've researched when I came up with a solution to triple a client's pricing. So literally you can, it's not very difficult. So I will answer these questions. So these are four questions. The, th the fourth question has a subset of three questions. So I'm just going to read them to you here. So what is my ideal client's annual business revenue? So if you're selling to B2B, you have revenue. If you're selling to B2C, replace revenue with income. What's their income level? Second question, what is the unique problem I help them solve? Why does this problem matter? And refine your answer to so what or who cares? So keep asking those two questions when you come up with your answer. If you have an answer, I help them do X, Y, and Z, ask yourself, who cares? And then answer that question. And then keep asking that question, who cares or so what, until you get very granular and very refined. Third question, how much is this problem currently costing your ideal client? For example, if you um, help your clients earn more business through marketing services, how much is that new client worth to them? And what's their opportunity cost of not doing the solution that you provide them? So how much is it actually costing them? Because remember, if you're solving a, like a bleeding problem, it's costing money. It's costing time. It's cost, costing frustration. So you want to quantify that. And the fourth question it's going to be a little bit uh, deeper and you'll have to definitely talk to your audience for this or do deeper research. Um, I'll give you some hints on to uh, where you can look at, but uh, to dive deeper, what are the true deep desires of your ideal client? The true deep desires, not just your surface level desires because everyone wants the same things, healthy. They want to be with family. They want to be uh, you know, prosperous in their work. They want to be, wealthy, et cetera. Like everyone wants those things. What's the real desire that they want? And to get to this answer, you need to understand what are the core, core world views of your ideal client? Because their world views shape their values, which shape what they want. Uh, that's the second sub question. What are the values of your you know, ideal client? What do they value the most? And where and with whom do they spend most of their free time? Because you can see what they invest in when they're off the job and what they invest in off the job is typically what they care about based on their values and their world view. So some tips on where to find these answers, obviously one, talk to them, talk to a lot of them. That's the only real way. Spend some time with them. If you're local, go to coffee with them, take them out for lunch or something. Another way to, to, to dive deeper, you know, you have your Reddit threads, you have your research threads on Google. But an, an interesting way is to actually join um, voice rooms. I think Twitter has uh, spaces or uh, the clubhouse uh, used to be a thing, but it's probably still a thing. But drop in, drop in and where your demographic is. What are they saying? What are they talking about? What are the emotions? What are the, uh, uh, the nuanced approach to their conversation? How are they expressing themselves? What words do they use? What words do they not use? Um, it's pretty interesting what you can do and actually be a fly in the wall of someone else's conversation who's publicly putting it out there because they want to share it with the world. So that's an interesting note to look at. So by taking the time to do this research and answering the transformation question, you'll know the real transformation you provide to your ideal client and who is best suited for the work that you do. Just as you go about this journey, I do want you to know that this is an iterative process, an iterative process. I'll say that twice. Um, the key is that you won't have a perfect day one and that's okay because odds are you won't have it nailed down and you'll have to talk to more clients, refine your process, practice, get better, measure your impact, measure client satisfaction, and then refine your core promise to the marketplace so you'll evolve in your transformation statements 
over time. And as you do that, you'll be able to contrast your pricing to the true value of the impact that you deliver. Now, I would recommend you name your transformation mechanism for the results that your clients get. So when you name this mechanism, it is your selling piece. It's what you're actually selling. You're not selling them a service. You're selling them the mechanism, the vehicle in which they're going to get transformation. Because at the end of the day, we have to remember clients don't buy services. We'll say this again. They do not buy your service, your product, your features. They don't care. They care about the results. They buy results. And what you're selling is that package of the results because they want to feel confident. They don't want to feel stupid when they make a purchasing decision because it is an emotional decision. And the name that you come up with, whatever you, however you want to package it, it has to be original, but the name won't trigger your clients to buy an expensive product. The naming itself, don't overthink it, but it's the name itself isn't going to make them want to buy So you have to map your offering value first and the impact of each offering for your clients, for them to see which offering makes sense for them. And when you package this together in a nice naming convention, they'll know I want this product with this tier at this price point because this is what I believe will help me achieve the goals that I want. And that's why I want to move into mapping your client's perception of your services value. So this is actually going to be a really fun exercise. So you know how I said that clients buy results? Well, it's true, but we want to make sure that we hone in on the actual core premise involved with every human purchasing decision. We talked about it earlier. It's emotion. So in this exercise, what we're going to do is we're going to dive into the core emotions that your ideal clients desire from your transformation and match that with the services that you provide to meet those emotional demands and make more sales. So the tools that you need for this is empathy. You need at least to understand your clients and have empathy for them. Uh, and at least 21 conversations with your ideal clients to do this exercise correctly. So if you haven't done this, get on 21 calls. And yes, 21, not 19. 21 calls. I want that call. When you get on that 21st call for you to pretty much know exactly how they're going to respond. And this takes time. Remember, as you refine this, you'll refine this over time as you talk to more people. And uh, before we dive into the exercise, I do want to shout out South Godin for inspiring this exercise. So take out a sheet of paper, so another sheet of paper, make a big T dividing the paper into four quadrants. On the X axis of the paper, you're going to write down one core feeling, your ideal client's desire with the transformation you help them achieve to be fully transparent, one of those core feelings that I deliver that my clients want is consistency. They want a certain level of certainty. They want to feel confident. So the core feeling is around confidence for me. What's your core feeling on the x-axis? Then on the y-axis, do the exact same thing. On the y-axis, to be transparent, my ideal clients want performance. They want to feel confident and they want a certain level of performance. So now that you've done this for yourself, don't copy me to do this for yourself because I have a completely different target market than you do. So definitely take the time to do this right. Now on the next, the next step is to plot out your service offerings on the map because you see you have a graph here and to see where each offering falls in the scale of these two feelings that you're delivering. Um, which offerings would get your clients the two feelings the fastest? So that'd be your top right quadrant and where should your core offer be ideally so you got to be looking at that as well and what can you do different to deliver at the the level that you want your clients to experience their transformation with you so like i mentioned earlier my x axis is performance and my y axis is confidence uh, I market as safety and reliability, so my client, my ideal clients want to have a certain level of performance, but they also want to feel safe and have a reliable approach to growth because you want to grow, but you also don't want to do a gung-ho, right? So on my map, uh, when, when you see my particular map, you can't see this because you're hearing it, but on my map, on the very top right corner, the service offering that I package together is a sprint program that gets 
clients the performance that they're looking for with the safety and the speed. And it gets those two emotions really quick, like almost day one quick, where they start to see the performance and the reliability and the safety all packaged in how they experience that service offering. Um, to del- for me to deliver safety and performance, I got to start looking at um, how do we package this into a tight, tight frame, uh, time frame, which is why I named the product the Sprint. Now, on contrast, if we look at to the very left of the Y axis and potentially sitting right on the, the X axis, so this is on the left hand side of the square of the, uh, of the quadrant, um, it's not uh, the X axis, again, being performance. I have my newsletter and the podcast, right? So you, it's, I mean, you'll get good safety, reliable information because this is stuff that's happening in the marketplace. It's, it's, it's real. It's proven. It's not, um, it's not made up theories, but you don't get the performance because you have to actually read it, do the exercises and put it into work yourself. You're not going to get the performance feeling and emotion of drive and like, oh, this is making a huge difference immediately. That's just the nature of this medium of a newsletter or podcast, but it's still an offering. It's packaged together. Um, And if you haven't read the Productive Profits Spark, I also have a newsletter version of this. If you head over to Substack um, or just go to the website, you'll be able to read uh, these and future publications where you get the best information for free uh, because that's my philosophy in business. Give the information away for free because that's what's really going to help the market grow as a whole holistically. So what you can see now with this exercise is that there's a wide spectrum of how you can, of how far you can go with each of your offerings. And I want you to plot, where does your core service offering show up in this quadrant exercise? Because as you review, here are a few points to reflect on as you review your offering, where, where you want to place yourself and how do you want to uh, your clients to perceive you and your service in the marketplace? So first point to reflect on is identify how your services stack up in the eyes of your ideal clients. Just the first ones, the, the ones that are gonna come out. Second is identify, and maybe you'll be surprised, of where your competitors truly are. Are they actually competitors? The people that you thought were your competitors, are they actually competitors. Just because someone offers a similar service to you doesn't mean that they're competitors. I know it's crazy because you're competing on different emotions, right? And if you position position yourself differently, uh, you can get a competitive advantage just by the way that you present yourself to the marketplace and delivering on those emotions. But as you actually plot this out, then you'll come to understand, oh, here are my real competitors. So the, 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 first, the second reflection is my competitors, are they really my competitors? And the third one's like, oh, these are my real competitors. The fourth reflection point, because you've mapped this out, I would recommend enhancing your vocabulary to consider adopting or removing specific words into your company or out of your company. For example, if, I mean, if I, going back to my example, performance and safety, if I adapt different words to deliver those feelings of performance and safety, then I should just adapt those and use those in my marketing and my podcasts. And when I have conversations with people, I think that's key. But if I start talking about something completely left field, like curiosity or things that my market doesn't really want, like they don't want to be more curious. They are already curious. They want to be more reliable in performance. So you see when you do this, you can start to understand what words can I adopt into my marketing, into my uh, company nomenclature, and in the way that we, 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 we produce your culture, your values, and being able to communicate that well to your your ideal clients. Um, And lastly, using this exercise, uh, we're going to show you how to deliver these core feelings at scale using the product value matrix. So I really hope that you looked uh, deep, that you took this exercise. It's a simple exercise. It's fun, but took the deep understanding of it because now we're going to really help you deliver this at scale. And before we do that, I do want to give you a bonus tip to review your, your own branding and 
the brands that you admire and are in the marketplace. So a good tip to look at is what brands right now in the marketplace deliver the same feelings that you aim to deliver. These could be clothing brands. These can be consumer packaged good brands. These can be uh, you know, a, a slew of different industries that they don't have to be in your industry. And one key thing to look at is what colors do they use? What sceneries do they use? What type of uh, imagery? What type of emotions do they make you feel? And how do they make you feel that way? And I think it's good to review what's already working from other brands to, to give you inspiration, not for you to copy. So I'm going to repeat that. Do not copy and paste. Take it for inspiration to create something new for you. So that's that's the key bonus tip here. So let's move into mapping your product value matrix and setting the foundation to deliver at scale. So in the last exercise, you understood where your core services stood in your ideal client's perception based on two core feelings that your ideal ideal clients had from buying your transformation. So I know that's a mouthful, but you, you understood where those two core emotions intersected and where your offering lands. In this exercise, is we're gonna take your core services from lowest to highest of this delivery spectrum. For example, going back to my example, remember one of the, my lowest offerings is the podcast and the newsletter because it's free, it's open, but it doesn't deliver high performance because I don't do anything for you. You just learn and you apply. On the other hand, for the sprints or those programs, those are higher tier programs, you bet they're definitely expensive, but there's a lot of performance included into that and a lot of reliability and safety because we're, we're using practiced and proven principles and we're delivering that on behalf or with teams. So just keep that in mind. So those that's how this this exercise flows and this that's how we're going to apply this into another exercise where you will need to take out another sheet of paper. And what we're going to be plotting here is your product value matrix. So here in this piece of paper, since I'm into letters, you're going to be drawing out an H and dividing the paper into three different columns. So in these columns, there'll be three different versions of your core services based from the lowest to highest on your perception map. Each of these offerings will have different deliverables. It could be the same, but just different levels of these deliverables, different timelines to achieve your ideal client's desired result, and different pricing. And the hint here for the pricing is one of these is your new higher price. And this is an easy way to review my emotional graph based on the products that I deliver. And if it's the same product or offering, how could you splinter these into shorter offerings? If you want to, you don't have to, um, or to a higher tier offering. And again, to justify uh, the emotional purchase and to justify a higher price point if you so desire to increase your pricing. So even though these three versions of your core offer differ, they all drive your ideal clients closer to their ideal transformation. They just choose different options to get there. And when you do this, you give them options to achieve their goals. And the cool part, you're kind of productizing your services. So you're making it a tier one offering, tier two offering, tier three offering. And my nuanced definition of productized service isn't to create a custom scope every time a client comes through. It's to say, this is what you're going to get at this level because I know that if you work with me at this tier, let's say it's tier one, for this price point and this time frame, you're going to get these results and this is the level of certainty or results that I've had in the past and this is why I believe it's a good fit for you. Perhaps it's a tier three offering that you're doing that, but the whole idea isn't to complicate your business to create custom uh, custom quotes and custom pricing is to have a stacked deck um, in the positive sense, right? But a, a stacked offering where you know exactly what you're going to deliver, know the timeframes for that delivery, you know the prices, you've calculated that this is profitable for you, and it serves your client's core emotional desires and it helps them get closer to their goals. It's like a triple win there. So as a savvy digi digital consultant, which you are, you want to make sure that with every option you provide your clients, that you have a streamlined onboarding process and a streamlined delivery process to ensure 
that they have key out like your clients experience the key outcomes that they're actually looking for because there's nothing worse than buying something and that thing you thought was amazing turns out to be you know a really sloppy fish and that's just a really bad brand experience and it's going to hurt reputation etc so we want to make sure that what we offer does match the delivery and ideally the delivery packs a bigger punch and creates a delightful moment uh I'd hope in the first week, if not the first 48 hours of engaging with you. So doing this makes it so much easier, I speak from experience here, to scale your delivery as you grow your team profitably. And the key exercise you did earlier with the task unit design, this allows you to grow confidently with profit at the margin that you want so that you can either reinvest in your business or reinvest in growth or reinvest in yourself and take that vacation you've been longing for. So how does this work with the marketplace and why why does creating better offerings and higher prices attract better clients? Well, winning clients want to work with the best. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, like, or maybe it doesn't, but people don't just want people who are serious about their business or serious about the the, the desired result that they want, they don't want to work with some sort of like $5 offer and potentially get results in a month. They want to work with someone that they can trust. They want to work to get the results. And because they've invested in themselves or invested in the the solution, they're more geared towards taking action and doing what's necessary to get the results, which is why I mentioned earlier that information should be free, but skin in the game is always required to achieve a transformation. If you have no skin in the game, you're not going to take action, um, at least in the business standpoint. So raising your prices does not only help you take care of the foundation of your business and team, but it also allows you to be more conscious of the types of clients you aim to attract and serve. Yes, you can say no. They're not a good fit. Save yourself the heartache and the headache. And it's, it's fascinating to see the psychology that the best clients, like I mentioned earlier, are not afraid to spend top dollar to get the best experience. And if I can italize over voice, I will italize this, experience, to get the best experience to create the transformation they want. Because if I go to the airport right now, I could take my car, I could take a ride share, I can ask a buddy, I could walk, I could bike there. What's my best experience going to be like? So we have the experience is truly understated in so many offerings in the online space right now. So how can you deliver the best experience and charge premium for that? So this is why if you create an incredible transformation for your clients, but price too low, your best clients will be questioning what's wrong with this service, what's wrong with the quality. There has to be something wrong here. If I'm getting this level of support and love and experience and transformation, but I'm not paying enough for it, there's something wrong. And it's weird how that happens if, if you undercharge. So it's you're you're not even you you may not be doing your your market a service if you're undercharging, but that's up for debate. So with this new awareness of what you're capable of doing and achieving in your business, it's now your responsibility to do everything in your power to create the best experience for your clients and craft the best offerings that deliver for your clients at a fair price that takes care both of you and your team. And I say fair price because you don't want to just take advantage for the sake of taking advantage of people. Like that's not what we're about. That's not what this podcast is for. This is not what the work that I do for. You want to do it both. That's fair to take care of your team, take care of the client, take care of the community, invest in yourself, invest in others, invest in growth. And that's how you're going to win. So as always, it's an honor to be a small part of your journey. If you found this podcast to be useful in any way, shape, or form, please consider sharing this to someone that you believe could implement it or get value from it. Uh, Just do a simple share because you may be the catalyst that opened the person you're sharing this podcast with to a new way of operating their business for growth. This is Raul Hernandez. Do good work.